I was literally flying out there. <laughs> to Chicago Marathon. Uh, before we get started, hit smash, pummel that like button, subscribe, because this channel just hits different. It slaps, it does one of those things. It's very violent, but in the best way possible. This is how to Chicago Marathon. The purpose of this video is to serve as a guide to other people who signed up for the Chicago Marathon in future years. So if it's 2023, 2033, you live in Australia, you live in the UK, you are flying over, you do not know what to expect. We're going to cover all things expo, how to get around town, places to visit. I will also include my race recap. So if you're one of my 47 subscribers and you wanna see how it went, you can skip ahead to that. Here we go. For those who are new to the channel, my name is Andrew. I started running at the age of 40, hence the name Midlife Runner, in March 2020 when COVID hit. I have no running prior experience, prior running experience. The only thing that I did in high school was drugs probably and then uh, drank a lot in my 20s and um, got sober around 30 so very rich rollian in that in that sense so I did some CrossFit in the mid 30s but really no aerobic fitness so the purpose of this channel is just to document my running journey uh, getting faster at an older age which is very possible through the use mostly of low heart rate training but uh, I do periodize it and do training plans. Mostly I just make jokes, that's the whole point of the channel. I happen to be running or talking about shoes, but it's just an outlet for me to goof off. The end. Travel day. Friday, first thing in the morning, me and my wife traveled from San Antonio to Chicago um, via plane. If you are traveling to Chicago and you're coming from overseas, I am also going to recommend airplane. Airplane seems to be the fastest and most efficient way uh, across the ocean. That's my cat right there. Once you're done flying, you are going to land at O'Hare International Airport or Midway International Airport. Me and my wife flew into Midway. If you land in O'Hare, I don't know how to tell you how to get to the city from there. Um, you're on your own. But if you land at Midway, you can take the L, you can take the train um, to downtown. You'll take the orange line. In advance of coming, you could download the Ventra app and be prepared. If not, you can just download it at the station. It's relatively cheap if you are Jeffrey Bezos and you got the coin, you could just Uber wherever you want because you're made of money. But um, if you're trying to be economical, you could take the train. It's safe. I don't know if you have any idea or preconceived notion of what the reputation of Chicago is outside of the States. Inside of the States, it's uh, supposed to be not a very safe place, but it was very safe. So you don't have to worry about those things. The Expo. Once you're in town, you're going to want to go to the Expo. This year it was at the McCormick Center. I imagine it would be at the McCormick Center most years as it's a very large venue. I've taken a business trip to Chicago and it was at the McCormick Center. There's a lot of walking and a lot of, a lot of really old guys uh, in Boston uh, marathon jackets flexing hard. I just let them go in front of me because they're very fast and important people and I just didn't want to get in their way. But um, jokes aside, there's a lot of walking. This is where you pick up your bib, this is where you pick up your shirt, Chicago Marathon shirt, so you can wear that around town and flex. It's all about the flex. Uh, all the major brands are represented there. You can walk around the expo. There's fewer of them and there's more of you. Uh, so the supply demand equation means they're gonna be charging top dollar. Um, so bring a lot of money if you plan on buying a lot of things. 
places to visit. All right, you're gonna be strategic with this one. Uh, me and my wife, we stayed after the marathon for a few days to knock these items off the list. You probably don't wanna to go to too many of these places before the marathon and wear out your legs. So first up is the Bean. It says the Bean. The Bean's actually at Grant Park. It's very close to the race. So you can probably see that one before you go on the race. It's right there. Uh, it's a Bean. That's a Bean. It's pretty cool actually. You should check it out. The Shakeout Run. My Shakeout Run actually started at the Bean with a guy named Kafuzi and the Kafuzi Run Club uh, YouTuber. If you're watching this, you probably already know who he is, but I'll put the link for his channel down below. Uh, and you can follow him on Strava. He usually does a group run. Uh, Asics was involved. So this run, we ran around the lake shore for three miles all the way to a deep dish pizza joint. Got to eat some pasta, carb up, and meet some really awesome people. Uh, met some people from across the pond, got to, to know people. And people is really the common denominator of this vlog and kind of the point of the Chicago Marathon. It's really a big part of the experience. It's a world major. And I think if I was really focused, I mean, we all have goals. We were trying to go for something, right? Maybe whether it's to finish or four hours, you know, mine was a three hour, 10 minute BQ. That was my goal, but really that's not the point, right? I think there's so much more to the city and to the marathon and all of the people. And that's really what I want to highlight through here. So if you're doing a shakeout run, I don't know if Kafuzi is going to be doing it in 2025 or 2045 or what, but it's worth looking into and you get to eat some pizza. 10 out of 10 recommend. Next up is the Navy Pier. Uh, it is a pier. There is a big ass Ferris wheel and it's a great time. You actually get some really beautiful views of the city. I feel like Chicago has a very iconic city skyline. Um, bring some money because everything costs a lot of money, but you gotta, you gotta check this one off the list as you go. Following that, we have the museums. Now I will tell you, there is a warning, a warning that we received, someone gave to us. The museums are kid friendly. Um, apparently there was no warning for it, but there are a lot of kids there. And I, I was, my mind was blown. I was thinking, you know, dinosaur bones, old rocks, mummies. Did kids want to see that? Chance in a million. There's also a planetarium um, right down the road next to the museums. Fair warning, kids also like space. You might see a few there too. Next up, we have Chinatown. We actually went to Chinatown quite a few times. Um, it's the square. This is uh, right off the red line. Uh, it's very close to the L when you get off. You should go to Chinatown. There's plenty to do there. Uh, we, the first time we went to Chinatown, we had some sushi. Uh, they had the, one of those cool new rotary sushi places. I don't know if you've been to those, but there's just sushi going down the line on a conveyor belt and with different color plates and each plate is worth uh, a different price. You just pick what sushi that you want to eat. When you're done, they add up all the total. If you order anything special or off the menu, this little train comes out and delivers it to your table, which is uh, really pretty stellar. We went back uh, a couple different times. We went for pho one time. Uh, another time we went for some boba tea boba tea like on every corner extremely safe cool loved it loved running through it we'll get to that in a little bit uh loved actually going there and taking my time uh in chinatown super awesome go to chinatown the end and probably my favorite place of all was a place called 5050 uh it's like a speakeasy-esque uh place looks like a laundry mat on the front my wife got us some tickets. My wife got us some tickets. Uh, you go in past the laundromat, not really a laundromat, into a lounge area where people are drinking and watching a magician. It's a magic show. Spoiler alert. Since you bought tickets, you go past, it's like very Inception-esque. You go into like the second 
place. I, there's no video allowed, so I don't have any video from this whole experience, but they have three or four magicians walking around who will perform tricks, magic tricks at your table while a three-piece jazz band is playing on stage. And then the headliner comes up who does a bunch of, uh, who's like the main attraction. There's another room I heard another place, uh, one room deeper for like more private parties. Didn't go there, didn't have a private party, but it was the most glorious hipster bullshit I have ever seen. Certainly, uh, I think San Antonio could use some, some of that magic in, in uh, Southtown. Even if it was uh, a comedy club, the best we have here is in San Antonio, a comedy club in, in the basement of the Magic Time Machine. That's a whole nother story and a whole nother vlog. We're talking about Chicago here. So let's focus. Of note, side note, some sort of note, I almost forgot and maybe it's too late, but book your hotel early. The second you get your acceptance letter into the Chicago Marathon, if you have applied into the lottery system and you have found out that you are in, book it straight away. We did not right away. So our hotel, the, what we booked was called the Drake. It was three miles north of the start line. Uh, and then we found out we had only booked it for the day of before the race and the days after and not the day before. So we ended up um, finding a vacancy in the Congress. Now the Congress is pretty sweet because it's right across the street from the Grant Park. Also the most haunted place in Chicago, apparently, and an inspiration for the, the story of 1408, I guess, or the movie. But I did escape without receiving a post-life reach around or any sort of scars or any sort of visitations. So we're good. Did not, I'm not gonna blame my race performance, success or failure on that. So those are just some of the places that you can visit when you're in Chicago. There's obviously a lot more. You can probably Google it and find a lot of other cool places, but those are just some of them and I thought I'd show them to you. Now, let's get to race day. On race day, I woke up three hours before the start at 4.30, I hung out at the hotel, got ready, had just a little bit of coffee, went to the bathroom and started heading down to the start line. As I previously noted, I was staying at the Drake, so I was about three miles from the start line, so I took that time to just jog it to there. Um, the idea, what I heard was to get there early, and I was not the only one. There's just waves of people, lines moving towards it. Some people are jogging, some people are walking uh, to get past the security checkpoint. The bag that you got and picked up your bib on is your gear check bag. It's clear to see through. It's the only one they accept. You'll have a tag on it. You go through uh, the security. It went by really quick. I got down there probably an hour and a half before the start. Got in line, went to the bathroom again, even though I didn't really have to go uh, that much just because might as well. Then I made my way to my corral. I was in corral C. Um, the corrals are rather long and there were people warming up and running up and down the corrals because they weren't very crowded an hour before, even 30 minutes before. It wasn't really until the corrals closed 20 minutes before that they started to get packed in a little bit. So I was on the front of C and so I could see into the AB corral in front of me and there was, it was, plenty spacious and um, it was not as crowded as I thought it was going to be in my head before I got there. Actually, before we go too much further, I do wanna take a step back and go over my plan, nutrition, and the training. The training, I did a higher running training plan, Sage Candidate and Sandy Nypaver. I don't know how to say that. I really think those two need to get married so I could just say one last name. Uh, Canada works, right? Sage and Sandy Canada. We'll say, okay. So I tried one of those plans. Um, I didn't really peak out at the mileage I should have, but I did around 45, 50 miles a week. Uh, so it wasn't um, terrible. I made videos week to week. You can go back and watch all of those if you're really bored. Um, there's a lot of jokes in them at least. Uh, as far as the nutrition goes, I listen to Believe in the Run and also uh, Fuel for the Soul podcast, um, which 
has some of the people from Believe in the Run and Megan Featherston, who had a carb loading guide on her website, which I looked at nine months ago and I wrote it down and I was committed to eating 550 carbs, grams of carbs, a day for three days going into it. Pro tip, that's a lot of bagels, so drink as many calories as you can through the form of like naked uh, fruit juices and smoothies and you can get to 500 grams of carbs. All right, so my race day plan is as follows. Don't bonk. That's it, really, that's it, don't bonk. This is only my second marathon. The first marathon, I bonked, I crashed hard, I didn't. I made every mistake you could possibly imagine. I carb deloaded because I read an article about race weight and I was trying to lose a few kilos. Right before the race, I uh, drank too much caffeine, I tried a new product. Um, for nutrition, like a new gel that had more caffeine in it. I didn't know, I thought it was something with electrolytes. I crashed at mile 11 in that first race and I had to walk, jog 15 miles. I don't even count it. It did scar me to the point that my whole goal for the second one was really like, don't bonk. Err more on the side of conservative, like just go out um, at a seagull, whatever the seagull was for me, in this case, three hours and 10 minutes and then sort of accelerate um, into, which is 3.10 is also my Boston qualifying time. So that was the goal, right? How did it go? And for my metric friends, the pace I was gonna go out was about 4.30 a kilometer. And then um, for my non-metric friends, my metric enemies, I don't know, it was 7.14 a mile. That was the goal. So how did it go? I'm gonna break this up into like, Ks, so like the first 5K. The first 5K, the first 5K. They say you can't lose the race in the first 5K. They're wrong, I lost the race in the first 5K. So it was comical the amount of things that went wrong. First of all, perfect weather, 45 degrees, we're in the crowd, everybody's shivering. You know, I'm like, why don't they just leave their jacket on? I had two jackets. One jacket I had taken off when I got in the corral and I donated it and the other one, I was gonna warm up with it, run a few miles, and then take it off as I went. And the crowd in front of me, I saw they all still had their jackets on. Well, right when they started, they threw their jackets off last second, I kept mine on. It was a zip-up jacket. It was a green jacket, it had, uh, I don't know, orange stripes, Adidas, you don't need to know these details, they're not important. What's important is that that jacket was zipped up over my bib. As a consequence, when I went underneath the start line, nine minutes after the gun went off, it didn't register my chip. I don't know this, I'm just going, right? And I'm moving along. Then, probably 400 meters from the gun, right? It's very crowded, I can't, I'm really having a hard time gauging my pace, right? Uh, I can't really look at my watch, I know this because there's buildings downtown, I can't trust my pace. Don't even worry about it, just go with the flow. I've practiced this, my heart strap falls off. This has happened before, it's been about a year before this has happened, and I catch it, so I reach underneath and I catch it. I also have handhelds, because I train in Texas, handheld water bottles, right, with plenty of electrolytes and drinks. In Texas, you need this. After a mile, I mean, you do a long run, you need to hydrate. In 45 degree weather, uh, in 50 degree weather in Chicago, I did need it, but I didn't know that. So I've got handhelds going on, I've got my, I'm holding my, my heart rate strap, right, people are starting to pass me a little bit, but I'm going, uh, I'm going along. I'm like, okay, I gotta get my jacket off. I have to get this back on, right? And then my watch goes off. Auto lap is still on. My auto lap button had been off for weeks, right? Because what's supposed to happen in Chicago when you run the marathon pro tip is that you wait till you cross the mile marker and then hit lap manually. And that's how you know how fast you're going because you can't trust what your pace is with all the buildings. But for the shakeout run, I had decided to turn auto lap back on and then I forgot and I blanked and I turned it off. And it said 7.13 a mile, which would have been great except that I could see the first mile in the distance, the first mile marker in the distance. It took me another 45 seconds to get there. So my first mile was eight minutes. I'm like, okay, that's fine. <laughs> I got 25 more miles, I can catch up. It's not that big a deal. I don't need to go erase this right away, but I have to get this jacket off of me, right? 
So in the process of doing that, I, I, I took off the jacket. I was like running with, you know, like this and getting my jacket off. And I had the bottle in my mouth while I'm trying to do this thing. And the second mile goes by and probably 726 and I'm 15 seconds away from it. So I think the second mile is like 745. This is not going good, right? I finally fling my jacket off. I step to the side. I put my heart rate back on and I start to go. And then I put my music, right? My music was working on my way to the race, right? I had, I had the ear pods uh, and it stopped working in the corrals because there was just too much going on, right? So I hit play on my phone and the music starts playing on my phone, right? not in my ears. So I have to like bring down the menu, do Bluetooth, then find the one to connect, power on, right? Making sure it's all there and then it connects. And then finally, after the third mile, my heart rate strap was on, the jacket was off, everything was good. I could hear music and I was 5K in. At that point, they picked me up for the chip at the 5K mark. As you watched it live through the app, my wife was watching it. She was texting me what my pace was throughout the race, which she didn't know, but it was not accurate, right? Um, the, what it should, if it gave me the gun time, when I went underneath the start line and it couldn't register my bib, it didn't disqualify me. It just didn't know I was racing. The race, it didn't know, right? So when I went to the 5K mark, that was the first time I got picked up and it was like, oh, this guy's racing. Right, so the only fair thing to do was to give me the gun time, right? When all the elites went off running 208s, right? It's like I gave them an eight minute head start. And so if I was gonna catch them, I was gonna have to run sub two. So obviously that wasn't going to happen. Um, but I didn't know this. I'm just running like an idiot through the streets of Chicago and enjoying every single minute of it. High-fiving a bunch of kids. You saw the video, there's plenty more. I was just having a grand old time. Uh, but I didn't know at that point at 5k kind of where I was at. I was just sort of settling into like, okay, I know I have some time to make up, but I also wanted to negative split. So let me just cruise all of the, like I overthought it. It seems like from the first thing I could just, if I would have just had my jacket off and then maybe if my heart rate strapped and fall down, you know, whatever. But anyway, it was pretty wild. Let's get to the next 5k. For the second 5K, I spent most of my time laughing because of everything that happened in the first 5K. Listen, if you can't laugh at all of the ironies in life, then you're not in on the joke. It was hysterical to me. Um, you know, I picked up my pace, but I didn't want to like dip into threshold. Uh, I think it was maybe around uh, mile six when I saw a pacer come up in front of me and I saw the back of his shirt and it said 315. And I was like, uh-oh, like I'm supposed to be with three tens. And I realized that this swarm, like this this mob of people in front of me, like, wow, that's a whole pace group. They're all with them, right? And now, I mean, I haven't run very many marathons. And so hearing people talk about being swallowed by pace groups, it's like, oh, I get it now. This is what it looks like. This is what it feels like. Well, I'm gonna have to turn it up. So I, I passed them up and we moved on. A lot of the 5Ks uh, segments, like they all kind of felt very uh, similar because I was just cruising at that point and really taking in the crowd, high-fiving kids, hitting the little uh, mushroom power of Mario guys and, and bolting off, you know, coming around corners with my arms out. I think that was in mile number 18 or somewhere 20, like somewhere towards the end. I, I was still having fun the whole time, right? Because to me, I'm only, this is the first time running Chicago, maybe my last, because I don't want to train through a Texas summer again. And really it was, I wanted to absorb the experience all the way through and I wasn't really married to the, the time. You know, I have time goals, I want to hit them, but uh, you know, I'm not gonna say that I didn't have fun or my experience was it good or this day sucked, whether or not I hit some arbitrary number that I decided was important for me to hit. So I'm closing the gap and my wife texts me and she says, and I can see it on my phone, I pull it down and it's like, hey, you're on pace for a 308. In my head, I've increased my pace to about a 706 or like a uh, minute to mile or like maybe 422, uh, 423, 424, somewhere around there per kilometer. 
So I'm increasing the pace. So when I, in my head, I'm thinking, okay, I'm doing this on mile seven or mile eight. It, she must be tracking that I'm running this pace. It must think that if I continue this pace, I can slide under 310, but I'm gonna have to continue this pace. At that point, I just had my heart rate put up and my heart rate was the high 160s, low 170s, which for me is short of my threshold. So I'm running comfortably. Um, I will say this, this is a fun thing to do if you want to. Like what I did, I posted on the show, socials. I said, hey, I'm gonna be running. Here's my bib number, here's my time, whatever you can track me. Also, if you wanna text me between the hours of 7.30 and 10.30, like uh, you can talk shit or you can just send me like uh, inspirational stuff, that, that would be really cool. And then I can I could read it as I was going and it would be like very fun. And some people did that. Like right when I was about to start to dig and like run too early, like uh, my buddy Vince texted me and it was like, breathe, you know, follow, uh, follow the heart rate, you know. Cause it was still early on. It was like maybe mile number, 10 or 11 and I was thinking I'm gonna close it down. Now, um, I didn't really know where I was. Uh, I knew that I was about eight or nine minutes off the gun time. So uh, I was going to look and push my lap button because it was lapping all the time and then I was lapping all the time. I was like, okay, let me just get to the, the halfway point and then let me hit my lap button. Then I'll know generally kind of where I'm at. So that's what I did. At the halfway mark, I hit it and it said 136.15. So I am a minute 15, roughly 75 seconds off of my pace. So I think all I have to do is close in 704 miles for you know seven or eight miles, and then I can hit that full stride, hit that 714, no problem. My wife is still texting me, you're on pace, 308. Sometimes 309, sometimes 308. And she was meeting me everywhere. To note, there's a video, I'll put it down here, link. It is a spectator, spectator's guide to the Chicago Marathon by Kafuzi. My wife watched it, I sent it to her, and it is amazing. So she knew where to be. And I saw her, like, you can usually see him, okay, two or three times, or maybe two times down here, or whatever. Like, I saw her five times, she was everywhere. She was on a bike, she was on the train, I saw her in Chinatown. She was the one filming when I'm flying around the corner with my arms out there. Uh, she met me around the halfway point with a bottle of water, which I didn't end up needing. I ended up chunking after like a couple of miles. It was like, you know, uh, because also of note, the aid stations, like they're out there on the street. When you have to veer off to the left or to the right to get the Gatorade or to endurance or to get the water, you're not going that far. Like, yes, I had a handheld. And in that moment, when people split off to the left and right, I was just like part, like the Red Sea was parting and I was just going through it. I didn't gain that much more time, right? I was still carrying this thing. I probably didn't need to carry when the weather's nice. Uh, I think if it was really hot, maybe it would be a different story. Anyway, shout out to my wife. My wife, she's a real one. Uh, huge support, felt the love and uh, I love you and thank you. So on the back nine of the race, um, from like 13 to 18, I still kind of kept that pace. I was closing it down. I was doing 704, 706. Like I still felt good. It didn't feel like I was uh, pushing myself too much. Uh, my heart rate started to get a little bit close to the threshold around mile 17 or 18 and I was like, great. Because once you threshold, you're just like, okay, I got an hour. I've got nine miles when I'm fresh. But I've been running a marathon and I don't know if I'm gonna run out of juice or bonk at any point in time. So I still just kept pushing it and I thought, well, I'm supposed to like latch on to people. So I've heard later in the race, but they're all going slower than me, right? So at this point, I'm just passing people. I'm passing a lot of people. Right, and it's giving me a false sense of security that like I'm going faster than I actually am, and I'm still going a good pace. But my wife's still texting me, and she's still telling, "Hey, you're on 308." And then I think around mile 22 or 23, she texts me, "Hey, uh, it's 309." Okay, now it's back to 308. So I was like, "Okay, cool." So if I just continue on this pace then I should be good. I felt like I could accelerate. I had, I was taking Morton gels all the way through and through with one calf Morton gel that I took at 20, mile 20. Um, and so I was just humming along, 
felt really great. In fact, next time I'm probably like at a, I'm a big city marathon, I'm gonna take out the ear, uh, the music, because it's really not necessary, right? Like the crowd support in Chicago is off the charts. Like when, when I came around the bend with my arms out flying, like the face of one of the spectators was like, ah, like just going nuts. They were more excited it, I, than I was to run the race, you know? And so uh, it was great. It was just, I can't recommend it enough. Uh, there are other videos out there that really show that support, but uh, it's energizing. It is fantastic. And I wish I was 100% focused on that. So uh, anyway, I kept expecting to fade. I kept expecting to hit the bonk and that probably had to do more with my first race experience than anything else. I didn't fit, uh, fade at all. And I feel like in retrospect, if I had to like, they were, I felt like I ran harder in many of my training runs in the Texas heat and humidity than I did in the marathon. And I think this Chicago marathon, it felt like I, I ran it but I didn't feel like I necessarily raced it. I also didn't feel like I needed to because I was on pace for my 310 goal. So um, I make a push, there's a little hill at the end, everyone makes a big deal about it, it's not that bad. I accelerate to the end. Uh, the time at the finish line says 319 something, right? I finish, I cross the line. Um, I'm, for some reason, I'm like, don't ever hit the, the button right when you cross the line. You gotta make sure, you, just in case, it goes all the way over. I think I ran 26.5 something miles. I ran like 0.3 over, because I wasn't following the blue line in the middle of the road all the way. I turned my watch off maybe five to 10 seconds after, and then I just walk, start talking to everyone. I'm a talker, that's all I do, right? Just making jokes, talking to people, talking to this guy. Um, of note, when you finish the Chicago Marathon, you will walk like um, a good mile, it feels like, before you get to the finishers area. So I hope you don't, you, you leave a little, just leave a little left. You know, don't completely empty the tank. I mean, they probably have they do have lots of uh, medical support and anyone who needs it when they cross, but um, you're gonna be walking. So as you walk, then you get your medal. You see all the, the people, I got my medal. This guy next to me got his medal. It's kind of cool. Uh, you, you, get, you earned your banana, you got your banana. Um, they give you, um, you can bring a jacket, but they give you that little foil thing to stay warm. Um, I wasn't cold at all. Um, after the race, which maybe you know, speaks to me not running as hard as I possibly could, but that's it. The result. The result chip time was 319 something. I don't even know what it was. It was whatever the gun time was, because I got the gun time. My watch on Garmin Connect said 311.02, I believe, and my Strava's said 310.15. Oh, surprise to me. I mean, I didn't, I thought I was coming in like at 308 or 309 or whatever. My wife was texting me. And then anyone who was tracking me, it, they were saying, hey, you were, yeah, you, the whole time I was watching you, you were on pace for like 308, 309. And then, then you were there and it was like 319, like whatever, you finished it in that. So what did I actually run it in? I actually ran it in according to my Garmin Connect at 311 or Strava 310, something, right? And so um, I think, I told my wife, I said, listen, I'm not gonna push it unless I'm up against the sub three. If I go out and I start running and I hit the lap button and it says 652 and I'm like, oh, maybe, you know, I'm running easy here, like marathon pace and it feels like a 652, I could, maybe I could hit a sub three. Or if I was up against it and it was like, I'm coming close to a 310, I just need to push it a little and I'll get there, then I'll do it. But I didn't because it said I was on pace for it, but I wasn't. So, how to Chicago Marathon. High five every little kid on the course that you see. Every little mushroom that says power up touch here, touch it and get that boost, feel that, feel that mushroom, that toad head and just, and then, and then go for it, right? Uh, dance, hype them up, I mean, I'd see some guys, you know, they're doing this number, you know, whatever else, right? But, uh, you know, I read all the signs, I enjoyed, I interacted, the race while it was going, um, it, it is absolutely awesome, the support 
before the race begins, from the city, during the race, after the race, it is phenomenal. And I, I just, I know I didn't want to go into the race and say like, well, if I hit this race, there's like two types of people. One person who's like, you know, don't talk to me, where am I going? I'm sub, you know, I'm gonna run sub three, sub three, sub three. This is the day, run sub three. And it's like, dude, you're the only one who cares about that. I mean, like, I wish the best for you in life in general, right? But I, I don't really care, right? And if you hit it, cool, but like it, you know, like don't not have fun if you don't hit some goal that you decided that you wanted to hit, you know, that your body may not even be ready to hit yet. So I don't know, I, I, I just, I, from the Kafuzi Run Club and meeting everybody there. I met people from Australia, down under. I need to tag everybody's like channel who I met. Uh, we got Milo from Run Der Estimated. Um, there's uh, this guy, Tim from the UK. I don't know if he has a channel, but anyway, there's so many people that I met um, from all over the world. And it was such a, it's great. It's like the running community, but at the biggest scale possible, right? It's like you have your local run club, in your own town or in your own city, but like everyone's converging and we all have this in common. And I think with today's society and like with our phones, it's really easy to stay disconnected and you can sit right next to somebody who's traveling across the world to do the same thing that you're gonna do and like the same thing that you're gonna do, right? And you just be like, how about that Nova Blast 3? Straight fire, son, right? And then we'll be like, yeah, we're here to check. A6 is here, right? Like A6 is there, right? Like it's, um, it's, it's all there. So <laughs> everyone's there, Nike's there, everybody's there. But uh, it's just such a, a really magical experience and it's something that I know I won't forget and it's really cool. So that's how I feel about it. Like the time, I don't even care about the time. Like I'm going to race a half marathon next and then maybe a marathon in the spring, maybe not. I know it's a big time commitment. But um, either way, eventually I'll get there, right? It's not, I mean, you just run a lot. You run a lot, you'll get faster. I mean, <laughs> it's pretty much it. Make sure you don't get hurt, you know, stay healthy and then you get to your goal, you know? But it's like, um, that's it, that's my take on it. Man, that was a lot of talking. I'm gonna go ahead and step off my soapbox now and go pick up my youngest from school. Thanks for watching, do all those things. Hit like, hit subscribe. Don't hit like, don't hit subscribe, don't share it with your friends. Uh, but thank you for watching this and I hope you have a blast running the Chicago Marathon and see the sights and take it all in. Uh, it's an awesome journey and I'm excited for you. Hey baby, should I should I do like our spoken word deal that we do? Like, like Chicago, 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 no, Renee Zellweger, no. Chicago Cubs, but I did fly the W, but we had to take the L. Chicago, Chicago came, Chicago went. It was magical, 50-50. Chicago ghost in the hotel room, Congress. No post-life reach around. No, okay, I won't do it.